Dear learners, welcome to this course Advanced Thermodynamics and Combustion. We are in the first module that is review of basic thermodynamics. So, on this uh, module we have following topics which we are going to discuss in the subsequent lectures. The first lecture we will be discussing about temperature and zeroth law of thermodynamics. It will be followed by the first law of thermodynamics which involves the introduction of work and heat transfer concepts. Moving further, we will have the third lecture on this module that is second law of thermodynamics involving heat engines and refrigerator or heat pumps. Now, we are in the first lecture and the title of this lecture is temperature and zeroth law of thermodynamics. On this lecture, we are going to discuss the following topics. One is macroscopic and microscopic approach. Then we have thermal in equilibrium and concepts of zeroth law. Then we have concept of temperature and its measurements. Then we are going to introduce simple thermodynamic systems and in particular hydrostatic systems. Another point that I would like to emphasize here is that in the basic thermodynamics course we have covered all of them uh, in some sense, but however here our approach will be little bit different in a sense that because it is advanced thermodynamics course and it we are going to treat the same concept with different philosophy and everywhere we will try to see the it is try to involve uh, more towards the mathematical concepts apart from the physical background. So, let us start the first segment that is macro, macroscopic and microscopic approach. As the word indicates macroscopic is a global phenomena, microscopic is a kind of a molecular phenomena. So, in a same sense we deal this thermodynamics course either in a uh, global phenomena or in a large scale situations. And other way we are looking at this microscopic approach in the molecular level where we take the uh, information at micron size or molecular size and try to grasp the information about the global properties. However, both the approach have their own advantage and disadvantage, but at the end of the analysis we are uh, going to conclude that both lead to the same inferences. So, this is the overall picture of this particular segment, but before you go deep into them let us see that what does this word thermodynamics means. It is nothing but the science of energy. As you see that energy is available in many forms like we have thermal energy, we have electrical energy, we have mechanical energy we have hydro or wind energy, nuclear energy, energy is also available in the form of uh, uh, chemicals that is in the fuels, energy is also available underground of earth and we call this as a geothermal energy, we also have solar energy. So, there are multiple source of energy and they can be linked together. Now, when I say this energy, this energy when it transfers it transfers either in the form of work or heat which is the essence of this course and uh, these work or heat interactions they can be linked together and that is nothing but the science of energy. How we are going to link it that is the theme of this particular topic. Now, when you say this uh, the energy conversion it it can be applied to many applications like power plants where we have steam or we can have gas based power plants. 
we can have IC engines, internal combustion engines, aircraft engines. We have also many cooling systems such as refrigeration, air conditioning and human body itself is also a kind of the uh, source of uh, uh, energy. Now moving further to our basic topic that is macro and microscopics. So, this particular picture shows that uh, there is a container that contains this gas. Now, when you deal this microscopic in a gross sense, we can say that the specifications of this gas in a thermodynamic viewpoint can be represented as its pressure and it occupies certain volume and it has some temperatures. So, this is what we call as a macroscopic approach in defining the state of this gas. Now, in same sense, if you want to go to microscopic approach, then we can view this entire gas to infinite number of molecules and each of them uh, is placed at a particular uh, locations that are specified by their coordinates x i, y i and z i in space and correspondingly each molecule has its own pressures in x, y, z directions and also similar informations can be represented for volume and temperatures. Now, when you deal with these individual molecules and try to grossly integrate to the entire systems, then it becomes a macroscopic viewpoint. So, this is the gross meaning of uh, microscopic and um, macroscopic approach. Uh, and another before you go further, let us understand some basic terminology which in fact we all know from the basic thermodynamics course. First thing is system. System is nothing but the region within the arbitrary boundary in which our attention is uh, focused for investigations. So, as you can see in this figure, our we can draw a system where we want to study what is going or going on within the system. But this system is limited with respect to surrounding by a boundary and we um, boundary and this boundary uh, there are possibilities that we can think of this boundary as a uh, fixed boundary or we can say it is a stretchable boundary or moving boundary. So, what depending on the requirement we can say that system and surrounding they constitutes system and surroundings are separated by a boundary and both when integrated uh, together then we call them as a universe. Now, again another topic of discussions in the basic thermodynamics course was that system can be closed systems or an open systems or it can be a third category it can be isolated systems. When you say closed systems, then we say that there is no mass interactions, but there is a possibility of energy interactions. So, it is a fixed mass system. So, this uh, can be viewed as a piston cylinder arrangements where you have a constant mass, the mass can uh, this piston can compress this gas or expand this gas. So, depending on the motion of the pistons, we can say the gas inside the cylinder is either compressed or expanded, which means that there is some energy interactions that happens between the systems and this and surroundings across this boundary. But when you say a, an open systems, there we relax this restriction of mass. So, there we say both mass and energy interactions are possible. So, is, uh, as you can see that some flow can enter into the systems and the flow can come out. Similarly, energy can enter and energy can go out. So, uh, there is no way of spe specifying this volume, but rather we say uh, we can say that there is a fixed volume or control volume where our attention is focused. And when the third category when you say it is an isolated systems, both system and surroundings with the between the system and surroundings there is no mass and energy interactions. Then we move to more details on microscopic and microscopic approach. So, when we start our thermodynamics viewpoint that means when we are putting our attention 
focus to a particular systems, then we have to think that what way we should proceed, whether it is a macroscopic viewpoint or macroscopic viewpoint. So, based on that, we say that when a system is chosen, the next step is to describe the quantities related to behavior of the systems and its interactions with surroundings or both. So, that way uh, we can say that there are uh, fundamental de descriptions in which uh, the we can say we have a macroscopic description means that we need to specify some measurable properties of the systems and with an assumption that internal structure of the system and the calculations of system um, characteristics. Then uh, another uh, uh, significance of this uh, macroscopic approach that it assumes the Newton's law of motion that is the fundamental laws of motion. So, Newton law of motions uh, talks about uh, force and acceleration that is mostly and uh, passively it also also says that is the what is the mechanical energy available for a systems and that is in the form of kinetic and potential energy. So, th with this we have some energies that is uh, taken care when we have the macroscopic approach. In addition to this, we also have another independent properties that is the macroscopic quantities that gives the property what we call as a temperature. And this temperature is nothing but the concept of another bearing to the energy of the systems and what we call as internal energy. So, ultimately in a macroscopic viewpoint, the thermodynamic coordinates mostly relies on Newton's law of motions and the concept of internal energy. Now, having said this, again if you try to emphasize the Newton's laws of motions, it, it has two essential components, one is force, other is kind of acceleration or motion. So, when I say when, uh, when, uh, when we try to correlate those Newton's law with respect to macroscopic situations, then we must uh, relate to the thermodynamic systems. So, let us say that we have two coordinates x and y which are independent in nature and x represents the generalized force and that comes from the Newton's law, but we view this gas as a pressure of the gas in a thermodynamic viewpoint. Another category of or parameters that force is related to accelerations or in other words initially this, the body is in motion. So, force is uh, in related to displacement and this displacement with viewpoint of thermodynamics we call this as a volume. So, in a, uh, in a sense that in a with same concept of Newton's law the macroscopic view of thermodynamic coordinates of a system can be specified in as a function of pressure and volume and they are related to each other that is one category. Another category I have already mentioned that which is independent to both and that is the temperatures. So, uh, both x and y coordinates and side by side with temperatures they define uh, the conditions of a systems and when the conditions of the system does not change we call this as a equilibrium state and this particular equilibrium set state gives the concept of zeroth law and in the subsequent slides we'll talk about mostly on thermodynamic equilibriums and uh, where we can say that how zeroth law is related to the thermal equilibrium. So, the existence of equilibrium state depends on the proximity of other systems and nature of the boundary wall which separates between these two systems. So, uh, to analyze further regarding thermal equilibrium and zeroth law, let us consider this particular figure. 
what has been shown here is that there are two figures one is the system A and system B which is separated by a adiabatic wall other is same systems A and B is separated by diathermic wall. The word adiabatic refers to the fact that there is a communication of heat is not possible, but in a diathermic wall there is a communication between the systems with uh, A and B is possible through, uh, uh, through heat transfer. So, what it refers or what it refers to our understanding is that uh, if you say uh, the first figure where system A and system B are separated by an adiabatic wall, what I can say is that if you have some uh, 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 state of the systems that is uh, here I will say values of x and y that means it can be generalized force or displacement or in terms of thermodynamic coordinates it can be pressure and volume and for system A and system B they are defined by these parameters. And for system B the, those parameters are, are like y dash and x dash. So, when there is a adiabatic wall which means there is no communication of the system A and system B is possible through this adiabatic wall. So, it means that uh, the we can the system can retain all possible values of x and y and system B can retain all possible values of y dash and x dash uh, as long as this adiabatic wall is there and there is and it is sufficient to withstand the stress that is developed by system A and B and of course, at this same time there is no communication of heat is in between A and B. But looking for the other figure where the system A and system B are separated by a diathermic wall, we can say that only restricted values of x and y are possible for system A and only restricted value of y dash and x dot are possible for system B, because there is always a communication between system A and A and B through heat transfer. Or you, and this particular mechanism we call it as a thermal equilibrium. Since we have put this word adiabatic and diathermic, so we say and, and the, ch the change in the system that happens is through the heat transfer, then the word thermal equilibrium fits to this philosophy. So, we can define this thermal equilibrium is a state that is achieved by two or more systems and it is characterized by the restricted values of coordinates of the systems after they have been in communication with each other through a diathermic wall. Now, moving further will let us complicate an, uh, a bit further that we will bring uh, in addition to the system A and B we will bring another system into picture that is system C. So, here uh, and uh, here uh, we view this entire systems that is that means we put both diathermic wall and adiabatic wall uh, into picture and they are arranged in a particular fashion. So, in a first figure here what we say that system A and system B are separated by an adiabatic wall and both integrated together they are separated with respect to system C by a diathermic wall which means is which uh, we can sense is that since system A and B are communicated by a, a system A and B are separated by adiabatic wall. So, there is no communication between A and B, but this communication between A and B can be possible through this system C. That means, system A can interact with system C, system B can interact with the system uh, C. The in other scenario if the locations of this adiabatic wall and diathermic wall is changed. So, it means that system A and system B are separated by a diathermic wall and both integrated together are separated with respect to system C by an adiabatic wall, which means that it is always possible system A and system B 
can come into the equilibrium and there is no communications between this A and B of integrated system with respect to C. So, in this case equilibrium can be achieved between A and B, but where in this case the equilibrium can be achieved in the first case the equilibrium can be achieved for A and B through the system C. So, this is the most essential concept of thermal equilibrium and zeroth law which says that the two systems are in thermal equilibrium with third then, uh, uh, then they are also in thermal equilibrium with each other. And it was initially proposed by uh, um, scientist R. Flower which is in, in the year 1931. And in fact, why this word zeroth uh, comes into picture here? Because this uh, since it was proposed in the year 1931, prior to this already first law and second law was um, developed. And the first law was proposed in the year 1842 by Joule and second law was proposed by Carnot which is 1824 and they have their own understanding and viewpoints since you know we need to follow a logical sequence then based on this the, the fundamental um, understanding was there that will put this uh, concept of thermal equilibrium and zeroth law as uh, thermal equilibrium and uh, thermal equilibrium as zeroth law of thermodynamics because it gives the concept of temperature and subsequently that concept of temperature was utilized in uh, for uh, first law and second law in the subsequent years. So, that is the reason the word zeroth law of zeroth law comes uh, as, as its own significance. Then let us move to uh, the further inferences that we get out of this zeroth law that is thermal equilibrium. Uh, uh, anyway first point that gives the concept of zeroth law is the thermal equilibrium. Uh, then while understanding this con concept of thermal equilibrium if you want to quantify then the word temperature drops in and in a layman sense it refers to the degree of hotness or cold coldness of a microscopic object. Okay. But the scientific understanding for this temperature can be interpreted through this thermal equilibrium, which means that we need to plot them graphically. And to understand this thermal equilibrium, we must say that all the states are in same temperatures. So, in other words, graphically the same concepts can be interpreted by representing in graphical form and we call this as a isotherms. So, graph, uh, isotherm represents locus of all points representing the state in which a system is in equilibrium uh, with one state of another systems and in fact it is a continuous curve. So, bringing the same concept here if you understand this is a system A and this is the system B what uh, and for a given set of conditions that is first condition 1 we can say the system was initially at um, uh, state point y1 and x1 then it moves to y2 and x2 it going then moves to y3 and x3 and all and when moving to when moving uh, pr these coordinates from one point to other it is in thermal equilibrium with respect to its surroundings so that means we can represent this as a continuous curve and as if there is no change happens that means system undergoes a change of state without disturbing to the uh, surroundings now uh, this is this happens at one particular set of conditions that is one similar things it can be represented for 
condition 2 and 3. Uh, in similar way we can put same logic for the system B for a set of conditions of 1 dash, 1, 2 double, 2 dash and 3 dash. So, uh, uh, to understand the characteristics of isotherm, we must say that the system property which is a temperature and it determines whether a system is in thermal equilibrium or not. That means, we can quantify this temperature with, with some number that will tell us whether the system is in thermal equilibrium with other systems or not. Now, uh, we, we gave the concept of temperatures uh, uh, or thermal equilibrium uh, through, a, uh, through this diathermic wall, but always it is not necessary that you should use the diathermic wall. So, for, uh, so for that things what we see is that we use some kind of mercury or some kind of liquid which can bear this con uh, the properties of this diathermic wall and which can me measure or record the temperature change through while while it is in equilibrium with the other with, with its own surroundings and such a device we call this as a thermoscope or many a times we interpret them as a uh, thermometers. Ultimately, what it indicates the equality of temperatures corresponding to one particular isotherms of the systems. Now, to quantify this, I, the first point we mentioned that in a layman says it gives the, uh, the uh, uh, hotness or coldness of the systems. So, ideally people refer this hotness because it is hot and that is hot because it is with respect to some temperatures. And that point of time the concept was the ice point and steam point. So, they were treated as a uh, very basic uh, uh, reference temperatures and with that respect people try to quantify this. Now, if you uh, similar concept if you in introduce here that when we say uh, we have plotted various isotherms for a system undergoing in different change of states, we can locate one particular point which will uh, actually define the reference point and that reference point is was chosen as the triple point of water. Now, in the same x y plot where y is your y and x are the um, uh, two independent properties involving Newton's law or it can be pressure and volume. So, based on that we can locate one particular temperature on this entire set of isotherms which we can say is nothing but the uh, triple point of water. And for this triple point of water, we can define the set coordinates as x t p and y t p. And that is chosen as the uh, uh, arbitrary that is chosen as the reproducible state uh, state for at a fixed temperatures. So, what does this tri triple point of water means? Here we have uh, uh, situations we have a thermometer bulb and it is put in a some medium or in a conditions in which we can say that uh, which, which actually measures the uh, triple point that is 273.16 Kelvin which means that this thermometer bulb is in equilibrium with this uh, complete uh, systems involving water, ice and vapor and at this particular conditions that is 273.16 Kelvin this uh, we can say all the state of uh, water all this all the three states are in uh, complete equilibrium or they all the three states can coexist together. So, so that was the basic point or 
one uh, broad sense of viewing, viewing this reference temperatures and in many situations people also interpret this steam point as 100 degree centigrade as reference and based on this we have different scales were proposed and this uh, scales was now commonly called as centigrade scale or Kelvin scale. So, what does this two scales means that when you say centigrade scale or Kelvin, Kelvin scale, Kelvin scale refers to the absolute temperatures where the view was that it is referred to the absolute zero temperature that is at that temperature the all the reference coordinates of temperatures were uh, calculated. And where we when you say centigrade scale in this it assumes that we have ice point, we have steam point based on these things we can see there is a rise or fall of mercury in a uh, in a particular device and, and we call this as a thermometer based on this rise and fall of mercury we quantify whether it is quantify the temperature of the system. Now, apart from this different countries use the philosophy of centigrade or Fahrenheit. In fact, the analogous to centigrade there is another scale we call it is Fahrenheit scale. Here the only the magnitude of number changes where and means that in a Fahrenheit scale the ice point and um, ice point and the steam points they are different and based on that we can have this coordinate. So, ultimately there are two uh, scales which relies on ice point and steam point that is centigrade and Fahrenheit scale and there are two scales that relies on the triple point of water that is Rankine and Kelvin scale. So, the corresponding relations between the Rankine and Kelvin scale it can be written as this, this is the standard uh, relations that can be used in our day to day life. For example, if you want to specify a temperature which we know as a in Kelvin scale and when you multiply into 1.8 we will get the temperature in the Rankine scales. So, this is the relation between Rankine scale and Kelvin scale correspondingly there is a relations between Fahrenheit scale and Rankine scale. We can have relations between Fahrenheit scale and centigrade scale also we can have uh, relations between uh, centigrade scale and Kelvin scale. Then uh, we will move to the next segment of our lecture that is simple thermodynamic system. So, from our previous understandings we say that the any state of the systems can be represented by its coordinates and we call these as a thermodynamic coordinates with respect to macroscopic approach. And when this coordinates changes we call this as a change of state. And when the system is not influenced by the surroundings we call this as a isolated systems. So, that means the interaction between system and its surrounding takes place when there, when there is a change in the system. So, we also know that that for a simple uh, system to exist in equilibrium there are three types of equilibrium first is mechanical equilibrium and there we say that there is no unbalanced force and torque in the system. But this mechanical equilibrium does not include the change or reactions that is happening within the internal structure of the systems. So, if that happens thermal equilibrium is not possible. So, thermal equilibrium is can also is possible only when there is no change in the coordinates in the systems. That means, system is in the mechanical as well as the 
chemical equilibrium. So, ultimately by clubbing all these three equilibrium conditions together that is mechanical equilibrium, chemical equilibrium and thermal equilibrium, we represent the state of the system as a thermodynamic equilibrium in which we say that conditions of all the three types of equilibrium are satisfied. That means, in a mechanical equilibrium there is no unbalanced force, in a chemical equilibrium there is no reactions and in a thermal equilibrium there is no change in the temperature. A thermodynamic equilibrium exists when all the three equilibrium conditions are satisfied. Otherwise, we say it is a non-equilibrium state. Then the philosophy of uh, the equation state was introduced which means that a system or uh, that entire systems can exist either in the solid phase, liquid phase or gas phase or when you say liquid and gas we say it is a complete the fluid state. So, based on that the thermodynamic coordinates bears certain relations, and those relations are in between are between pressure, temperature and volume. So, in order to change the state of the systems B and T are can be varied independently and corresponding equilibrium pressure can be de determined. Similarly, P and T can be chosen uh, to obtain V at the equilibrium what it means pressure and volume they can be integrated together that means when there is a change in the pressure there is a change in the volume and vice versa and temperature can be treated as an independent properties and when we define these particular states involving pressure volume and temperatures we call this as a equation of state and in particular we uh, have this equation of state for gas when we call this as a either ideal equation of uh, ideal gas equations or it can be interpreted to with respect to van der Waal uh, equations when you deal un, deal into the molecular approach. But however, when you deal with the liquids only pressure volume relations are possible uh, because we require only these two co we require the coordinates of pressure and volume and all these things happens uh, at for wide range of temperatures. Then after this thermodynamic systems then we will move to the hydrostatic systems. So, uh, prior to this why the word hydrostatic comes into picture earlier we used to say it is a thermodynamic systems. Now, we say it is a hydrostatic systems because we deal with the uh, behavior of a complete state of structures that means a system can exist in the liquid phase, gas phase or it can be mixed of both or it, if there may be concentration of the change in the mixture or uh, it can exist in different phase. So, depending on this the for complete set of understandings we call them as they manage hydrostatic systems. Now, within the domain of hydrostatic systems if you specify the particular characteristics for example, when you say pure substance which means it is a single uh, chemical compound that is solid liquid or gas or it can be a two phase mixture of mixture of all three then we can have a homogeneous mixture of different compounds that is mixture of inert gases chemically active gases mixture of liquids solutions then we can have the heterogeneous mixture of different gases which are in contact with liquids. So, these all these three uh, three situations follow uh, uh, under the common domain we call this as a hydrostatic systems and in fact in our entire courses we will be dealing with all these uh, um, uh, how to address all these uh, conditions of the systems and in terms of pressure, volume and temperature. So, uh, another important segment of hydrostatic systems is that uh, we say that 
pressure, volume, temperatures are three independent quantities and they need to be correlated. Now, to uh, specify those systems, we must have an understanding that how to quantify that. To quantify them, we have to rely on certain uh, mathematical concepts and that is nothing but the fundamental theorem of uh, partial differential equations. And in general, if you say that there is a uh, parameter z which is a function of x and y, we can write the exact differential of z that is dz as is dou z by dou x with respect to y into dx plus dou z by dou y with respect to x into y. Now, in another uh, situation, if, if, if we consider a function f x y z is equal to 0, there are two relations that comes out among x and y and z. First one is the um, dou x by dou y with respect to z, dou y by dou z with respect to x and dou z by dou x with respect to y and when you multiply them it is minus 1 and from this relation we can have another relation as well. And in fact, why I gave, gave this relations because we are going to uh, rewrite our pressure, volume and temperatures for these situations. So, here we have say, we have said that the um, we have three parameters pressure, volume and temperatures and pressure volumes can be coupled together and temperature can be independent in nature. Okay. So, for that we can define these hydrostatic systems mathematically. So, there are four possibilities uh, in fact, three possibilities which we uh, uh, which we can write that means, volume can be represented as temperature as a function of pressure, pressure can be represented as temperature and volume, temperature can be represented as function of pressure and volume. So, accordingly the exact differential dv, dp and dt can be determined. Again from the third relations that is we can think that uh, f of pressure vol from volume and temperature if they are function of 0 th is they are equal to 0 then we can have this reciprocal relations dp by dv, dv by dt and dt by d, uh, dp and they are for each cases the temperature volume pressure and volume are held constant and they when they when we multiply them it becomes minus 1 so we are going to use these four relations exhaustively in our all subsequent derivations or informations now based on this for an hydrostatic system the first property that we are going to discuss is the volume expansivity so, it talks about the how volume changes with temperatures by maintaining pressure constant. So, this parameter is represented as a beta which says that it is the ratio of change in of volume per unit volume to the change of temperature when the change occurs at constant pressures and based on this unit we can say it has a unit of which we call as a reciprocal of temperatures. And in fact, the beta is always a positive number except from specific cases. And in fact, it is seen that this value of beta is insensitive to the change in the pressure and it varies only slightly with temperatures. So, hence it can be regard, regarded as a constant for a particular um, gas or liquid or substance. The other property that we are going to discuss is isothermal bulk modulus and isothermal compressibility. The uh, first quantity that is isothermal block bulk modulus B is defined as the ratio of change in the pressure to the change in the volume per unit volume when the changes occurs at constant temperatures. So, this you can write this expression mathematically as B is equal to minus B into dou P by dou V at constant temperatures. So, here you can see that pressure and volume they are 
reverse relations that means pressure increase in the pressure will lead to decrease in the volume and vice versa. So, in order to make this B as a positive number, so a negative sign is introduced here. Similarly, uh, in correlation we have found out uh, the uh, another correlations that can be derived as the reciprocal of B and that we call this as a isothermal compressibility. This particular parameter was mostly used when you deal with the speed of sound and in fact it when you say we use this in the uh, compressible uh, fluid mechanics or compressible flow. And it is nothing but it is re reciprocal of this um, uh, isothermal bulk modulus and it is represented by kappa that is equal to 1 by b and that is equal to minus 1 by b dou b by dou p at constant temperature. Now, uh, let us recall our understanding that how both volume expandivity and isothermal compressibilities are related. So, here we are going to apply the first relations that first relations is between pressure, volume and temperatures and that is nothing but the reciprocal relations if you say F P B T is equal to 0 and that this equation was formed where d p by d v at constant temperature, d v by d t at constant pressure when they are multiplied it gives rise to negative of d p by d t and constant volume. And we have to recall the uh, parameters that is beta, kappa and from this uh, two things from these two uh, parameters one can find out the ratio of beta by kappa and that is nothing but d p by d t at constant volume. Then when we are going to uh, use it here, uh, we can uh, find uh, this what does mean means that we again start with another relations where your uh, p is your function of temperature and volume. We can write this d p by d t at constant volume then d p by d v at constant temperature d v and from this we can say uh, uh, um, at constant volume. So, this term goes to 0 as a result we write d p is equal to beta b by kappa into d t. And from this we can have relations between the uh, uh, pressure change that means from final pressure and initial pressure and for a given substance we, with for which we know beta and kappa and if a system uh, changes from uh, the uh, final temperature T i uh, initial temperature T i to final temperature T f then we can find out what is the change in the pressures. So, based on this concept let us see one important problem that is what is the, uh, the uh, problem which say states that a mass of mercury at standard atmosphere pressure and temperature that is 15 degree centigrade is kept at constant volume. That means, initially the condition was 15 degree centigrade and atmospheric pressure. Now, what happens that at constant volume the temperature was raised to 25 degree centigrade. So, we are going to find out what is the final pressure. So, we have to recall our very basic understanding which we say which says that uh, we have to see from the last slide we derive this expression d p is equal to beta by kappa d t minus 1 by kappa v d v. So, here what happens the system is at constant volume. So, d v goes to 0 then, then we can 
integrate these equations. So, you can write it as integration of d p that is from p i to p f and that is nothing but equal to beta by k integration of d t t i to t f d t and we do not know the value of beta by k uh, kappa. So, from this we have to use the data table that means any thermodynamic book will give you the give you this value of beta and kappa and for mercury this value I can note down as 1 beta is equal to 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 4 Kelvin inverse and kappa is 4 into 10 to the power minus 11 Pascal inverse. So, from this we can write P f minus P i is equal to uh, 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 4 divided by 4 into 10 to the power minus 11 into T f minus T i. So, T i is given 15 uh, degree centigrade. Then from these equations uh, when you put this uh, uh, equation here and P i is your. So, P i is equal to 1 atmosphere which is nothing but 10 to the power 5 Pascal. So, by putting P i and T f we can say the final pressure will be about 452 atmosphere. So, which means that we require 452 atmosphere to change the temperature by 10 degree centigrade because 25 minus 15 is 10 degree centigrade at constant volume. So, approximately 452 atmosphere pressure is required to change the uh, to raise the temperature of mercury by 10 degree centigrade or by maintaining constant volume that is most important. The next problem is uh, about this isothermal compressibility for air at 0.8 atmospheres. So, this is also a simple problem we have to start from the basic definitions what is the isothermal compressibility that is kappa and that is nothing but 1 by V d V by d P at constant temperatures. So, here it is we have used this working fluid as a air. So, we say P V is equal to R T and this equation can be written as P V is equal to R bar T where and 1 by V is equal to P by R bar T. From these things we can write D P what is D P by D V at constant T that is nothing but minus r bar t divided by p square. And when you put this equation here kappa is equal to minus and 1 by v we can write p by r bar t dv by dt is equal to minus r bar t by p square this gets cancelled p also gets cancelled. So, kappa which is isothermal compressibility is equal to 1 by p that is reciprocal of pressure 
and here pressure is given as 0.8 atmosphere which means that kappa would be 1.25 atmosphere inverse. So, this is all about the calculation of uh, uh, thermodynamic properties of a substance with this I will conclude the lecture for this class. Thank you for your attention. Thank mm -hmm. you.